And St. Johnston, I don't know, St. Johnston to me... are just shite. They're just a team that is there. I mean, they're never really good and they're never really that bad. They're just like a... I always see them as like a top of the bottom six, kind of. Seventh, eighth, ninth. I think that's St. Johnston. To the four St. Johnston fans out there, let us know what you think of your pish club. Ah, uh, you've got to love these jokers, eh? It's episode 13 of Dogger Saints, an unofficial St. Johnston podcast. We chat to Danny Griffin about co-coms, Clark and community coaching. We also chat to Brogan the Beagle about his matchday antics. And we finally meet George O'Boyle, just not in the Royal. All that and more. It's episode 13, it's the Dogger Saints unofficial St. Johnson podcast, and I am joined, as usual, by the only man that can sit down with a copy of GQ magazine, some fallout boy in the background, and when he's done all that, he gives his meat a good old rub, it's Danny Williams. How do you know what I was up to on Friday night? You live on the ground floor, you've got very big windows, I see what's going on. Creep. <laughs> been called worse. How's it going, mate? Have you had a nice week? Hey, it's been alright, mate, yeah, it's been getting closer and closer to... Hopefully some sort of normality, so that's nice, and it's nice that we're able to get a few restrictions lifted and whatnot, so... Well, welcome back, everybody, and hello to any new listeners that have decided to join us this week. You're in for a treat. Oh, you don't know what you're letting yourselves in for. You've no idea. Just go with it. You might enjoy it. You might not. You might think we're a pair of dicks. You won't be the only ones. <laughs> we'll start this week by discussing a couple of Saints stories. Not the Saints stories we are accustomed to, which involve you going to the toilet... One of them, which I feel a bit sorry for the boy. You may have seen this in the Persia Advertiser on Friday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the St. Johnson bottles of whiskey got given out to any, everybody. And I can see where this guy's maybe gone a bit wrong with it. Because I thought the same as soon as I opened mine. Each bottle has got bottle number one of 600 on it. Because there were 600 bottles and this was one of them. Now, I thought, oh, I've got the first bottle. Unbelievable. That's great. So I opened up the second one because my wife bought one as well for me without telling me. So I've got two now. And opened up the second one and that also said one of 600. And I was like... Oh, they must all say that. Now, for anybody who only bought one bottle, they might have got a little bit excited. Not as excited as Scott Thornton, who went to the PA with this story to say how delighted he was that he's got the first bottle. I mean, bless him. He's obviously got confused. And I know you weren't actually the only one of people I know, because a few of you guys were saying, oh, is that, you know, does that mean the first of the 600 or whatever? But going to the PA, I've read the story, actually. I think Scott Thornton... Maybe to a few uh, listeners of a certain vintage, you'll be a familiar name because I think he was the sports writer for the PA. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So once upon a time, and um, but he's he, he's made himself look a right mug. <laughs> He has, bless him, but just confirm, if you do have a bottle of St. Johnson whiskey and it does say number one of 600 in it, it does not mean you've got the first one. You've just got one of the 600 bottles available. Yeah, but we don't like to piss on anyone's chips here. So if you want to carry on believing it, by all means. You you do that. You deserve it. You've given your money to the club. If you want it to be number one of 600, you crack on, my friend. The next story, I say this, things that have appeared in the media this week. This isn't media related in the slightest. It's just a bit of showboating from us. We only sponsor uh, Elliot Parrish's away shirt now. <laughs> we do now sponsor El Paz's away shirt. He's been in touch with us a few times. He's a great lad. I mean, Liam Craig sort of touched on it uh, when we interviewed him a few weeks ago. What a great character he is. So, yeah, so we just thought that seems right to us. It does, and we wanted to get him on as a guest, and he dingied us. Then we sponsored him, and now he's our best pal. What a guy. When all this blows over, he wants us to do a couple of things with us, Dan. One is go play cricket in the Mutant Suite gym with him and the rest <laughs> of the guys. I'm very excited about that. That'll be, that'll be a, a YouTube video, that one. And the second one, he wants to go on a Doggers on tour to London and watch the NFL. If anything, I'm more excited about that. What a treat. We're both 49ers fans as well. Hey, you and I'll pass. Oh, yeah. Hey, Bob. Ah, uh, I've you, got a, he's probably been supporting them for a while. When I was getting in the NFL, I just put all the names in a hat and that's who I pulled out. I've got a bit of a thing for the Philadelphia Eagles. I don't claim to be a big, massive fan, but I've got a thing for them based on the Eagles tryouts episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Brilliant. Have you have you seen the um, the one where the, they go to the match and the Charlie gets left and the thing is kind of like Home Alone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a two-parter and they think he's on the bus, but he's not. And he, yeah, it's good good programme. Good run by Stevie May. He's in, he's out, he's there's in, and there's Melamed, and it's a goal for St. Johnston. 
Five minutes on the clock and it's Guy Melamed who has scored. Terrific play by Michael Halloran. The dummy run by Stevie May. Melamed just de delayed his run and there was O'Halloran and he just picked him out beautifully. And Stevie May gets a deflection off Scott yeah, Townsend. Yeah, now, yeah. Howie. Now here's a chance. Michael Halloran's in his pace. He's got him through and, and it's a goal for St Johnston. Michael Halloran has scored the 21st minute of the game. St Johnston to... Clyde, no. Stevie May slips in Michael O'Halloran. He uses his pace, and as Vaz came out to narrow it down, he just slid the ball under the Clyde goalkeeper's body to put Saints 2-0 ahead. And that's exactly what Callum Davidson and the players were looking for. Get that second goal as quickly as possible. And now barring a disaster for Saints. There's the final as whistle goes. The full-time whistle goes, and it is St Johnston to Clyde, no. St Johnson, we're playing in the Scottish Cup at home to League One Strugglers Clyde. Strugglers, that's a harsh word, but because they've played 95 games in the space of 96 days. So, yeah, before we get into the game, Dan, there were a couple of things. There was a half-five kickoff because Callum Davidson decided that it would give Clyde an extra five hours to re recuperate because it could have been an afternoon start. So, that's a nice thing to do. Wholesome. <laughs> well, that is what we are all about, Dan, as you know now. Wholesome in the 90s. That's two boxes we tick, like to tick on a weekly basis. And the, the gaff is the gaff is ticked him off. He was from the nineties, and he's done a wholesome thing. That's a win in my eyes. But wish we did play it early because the afternoon just seemed to divulge into chaos. It started off with a tweet which got deleted from Sean Rooney. Which, if you've seen it, you'll you'll know all about it. It was an odd one and something he probably shouldn't be writing out in social media. He very much misjudged that. And it was a very daft thing to do. And he's obviously got opinions and beliefs and <laughs> Christ, we've all got them. But maybe a little reminder from someone to the club, just don't do anything stupid. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't It was a great start to the day. He wasn't. He didn't feature yesterday. Whether that is that was because of uh, James Brown was going to play anyway or hopefully it wasn't going to be off the back of that. I think Rooney was probably going to be resting. I think Brown was probably going to play anyway. Yeah, it was... A silly thing to tweet. You've got to remember. I mean, Sean Rooney, he's, he seems a nice lad. He seems a real character. He's been fantastic for fantastic for us this season. But yeah, you just need to remember that you are in the public eye and don't make a rod for your own back. We know he's a Celtic fan and you're absolutely right. But we'll move on to the pre-match build-up on Saints TV of Kilmarnock versus Clyde, as it appeared on the, on the, on the graphic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed that a lot. People were obviously atting Saints on Twitter with the displeasure. A couple of things from that one. Who cares? It's, um, I, can, I can assure you, it's not somebody up at McDermott sitting with a laptop putting out these graphics. Yeah. The host company for, for Saints TV. And look, it looks a bit daft and I'm glad it happened because it was really, really funny. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a personal insult. It wasn't to go Jose Mourinho unbearable disrespect <laughs> it was it was a fuck up from someone that, that, and not from us <laughs> right. no it's all good <laughs> I, sorry I said I was getting rid of it I, I didn't because I like it so it will stay for moments of celebration like that so the game's kicked off and within two minutes more despair from St. Johnson fans worse than the badge was the first spelling out of the word Flonix <laughs> I'm glad he did it. Oh, yeah. Because my my Twitter game was my Twitter game uh, took off really because of because of Bleedy going in, right into it. I mean, now we've not touched on this over the 30 weeks. Well, we have slightly where we've spelled a couple of things out as a wee joke, but we'll we'll go into it in a bit more detail. It's really annoying a lot of people. It's really annoying a lot of people. And I think at the root of it. It's, it's annoying a lot of people. And for anybody who didn't watch the game or watch Saints TV, Mark Guidi, who does the Saints TV home matches, has to do a, a number of sponsor shout outs for Bin Group and Flonix. And uh, and I've got the examples here. You can visit them at Flonix, F-L-O-N-I-X dot co dot UK. You can visit bingroup.co.uk for more information. That's bin, B-I-N-N, group.co.uk. So, yeah, he's been doing it all season. Obviously, it's a little bit annoying. Look, he's got to do the sponsors. He's got to. That's part of his job. And given what we've just said, it shouldn't be a part of the job we, we can slag <laughs> him off for. I think at the root of it, I think people find it a little bit insulting to do intelligence. You can't spell saints. Here, yeah, I'm going to spell it out for you. And I'm sure, I'm sure he doesn't mean it like that. He obviously doesn't mean it like that. He's probably just a force of habit for him. But... Someone should have mentioned it to him by now. 
or whether he just doesn't care, whether it has been mentioned, I don't know. It should have been mentioned to him that people are finding it really annoying because at the end of the day, and it comes back to the root of this, I don't ever really like pulling the paying customer line, but that's what it is. People are paying to for this service to watch games that they can't go to. And there is a little bit of the whole entertainment value or um, customer satisfaction value mm-hmm. in that. Yeah, and enough people have said it enough times. Someone needs to have a word with him about it. Because not because he's necessarily doing anything wrong, but because, he, like you say, people are just starting to get wound up by it. Yeah. And whether it's a daft thing to get wound up by or not, that's a different matter. But that's just the situation as it is. I think the only way around the, the player sponsors, because you paid your money, you want a shout out on air. I completely get that for the people with the paying money. Maybe have the team lines on the page before the match as a graphic with the sponsors underneath. So people yeah. can see that that would be a one way of that. And people know how to spell Bin Group. It's on the front of the shirt. People know how to spell Flonix. They've been sponsoring St. Johnson in for a good long time. And they do a great job. People know how to spell Saints because it's the football team they support. This is very... And it's the word Saints. Yeah, this is true. Now, but I do completely get that the advertisers want to sponsor, but there might there must be another way around it. Yeah, I, I don't know. And we're not in that position, so we don't... You know, I don't know what his job's like, but... But yeah, he even said if you wanted to sponsor a player, you can contact Gemma uh, Anderson and he spelled out G-E-M-M-A. Ugh. I can't think of any other ways to spell Gemma with a J, but if it was with a J, you would say with a J. We've, we've glossed over the outskirts. There was a game we got through. It wasn't, wasn't a particularly good one, was it? Ugh, there was plenty of chances. The, the, first, so many chances. the first 25 minutes, I actually got a text from a pal saying, Saints are two up, could be eight or nine. So it will finish 2-0. And lo and behold, he was right. I It was that. I thought... And again, uh, Danny Griffin was on the cold comms. He pointed out, it was one of the first things he pointed out, Clyde had played three games in a week. Mm-hmm. Four games even in a week. And yeah, they were on a bit of a hiding to nothing. Actually, give Clyde the due, given how many games of football they played for semi-professional footballers, especially for any level of football, but for semi-professionals uh, who've got other workaday jobs. So have played that much football in a week and in the last couple of weeks, he's absolutely outrageous. And they were, they were a credit to themselves yesterday. I thought the fitness levels were fantastic. Yeah. And Clyde could have got themselves back into the game. Yeah, for because Liam Gordon should have bailed out El Parish. He was doing the right thing. He had a great game. My man of the match, and in my honest opinion, Elliot Parish, I thought he was outstanding yesterday. I tell you what, Big Lev Yashin was rising from the dead to applaud that performance. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was tremendous. Nah, it was, yeah, it was a look. It was a little bit of a mix-up. It can happen when you try and play out the back. Um, but again, it was the, the lad, um, the centre-forward, please forgive me, his name escapes me, but it was good pressing. And that's what Clyde were Clyde were doing when they had the opportunities to do so. But the amount of chances Saints squandered. McCart had one clear off the line, uh, a couple of shots yeah. over the bar in the first half. Melamed hit the crossbar in the second. Liam Craig had a couple of... Good strikes from distance. These are just the ones off the top of my head, but there was there was plenty. Like I said, we, the, the first goal was the first goal was a great ball through from Spoonie straight out up the channel to O'Halloran, who cut it back for a uh, millimeter tap in. Great goal. Second goal as well. It was uh, old school. It was um, May and O'Halloran linking up the, the team of 2014. Re-putting a great ball, slotted it past the keeper. Two good finishes. Well worked goals. Lovely finish. I, I thought it kept his cool very well. Again, for a lad who's not played an awful lot of football and not maybe not got in those positions like he used to, it was a fine goal. And I thought that was going to be the floodgates, really. It wasn't, but at the end of the day, it's a cup game and we're through to face one of the ugly sisters. Yeah, at that time of recording, that match has just kicked off. Off, so we'll be able to report back at the end of the game who will be playing in the in the next round and we'll have a look at that but you no know we're through at the next round there's not much more to say about it a couple of people i read on twitter saying it was a disgraceful performance it was boring it was which was which was nonsense it was they came flying out the traps i thought it was professional you can see the standard that st johnson have over clyde there are saints played well oh. For an hour, it was a very professional performance. I thought the last half hour, um, but Clyde probably in the last half hour thought, right, we've nothing to lose now. Let's go for it. And you do make a game of it. I think it, it does happen with football fans. They do go, we are inclined to go a little bit over the top with stuff and a little bit dramatic. <laughs> it wasn't disgraceful. It wasn't great. And it should have been more, but yeah, it was a win. A win's a win. It was. And now we're only three matches away from doing the cup double. 
How about that? It's exciting, isn't it? It's, it keeps you going. It's going to be a tough week. I'm quite interested in this game on Wednesday, which we'll touch on later on. The approach to that, knowing what's to come next weekend. Yeah. One of the men who would not be able to play on Wednesday is Glenn Middleton, because he is obviously his parent club at Rangers. Now, he said that he's open to staying at McDermott the next season. Would you want him back next season? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a lot more to come from Glenn Middleton. I think there's always a, whether you sign on loan or on a permanent basis, if you're coming into a side, and when he when he came in, it was just turning the corner. But if you, you come into a side, it, a settled side, it can be quite hard to, to break in midway through a season, unless, you know, sort of like with Rooney, where the opportunity came up because... Because Danny Mack uh, went back to Millwall. Mm-hmm. So, but I think from what we've seen of him, he's got a lot of talent. He's got the goal that secured top six. He's he's real hustle and a bustle. He's got a lot of pace about him. He's always working the working defenders. He's a wee busy a bastard, of, isn't he? He's a wee busy bastard. <laughs> but he's, he never gives the defenders a, a let up. And maybe when, you know, there's a couple of things that he, he's not quite a finished article with, but he's a young player. He's not going to be the finished article. His end, his end product's not quite there, either in front of goal or sort of providing balls into the box. I'd love to see him back because I think he's got so much more to offer. I think when they were saying, he, he's obviously keen and it's nice to see a lad who hasn't played maybe as much football as he thought he was going, coming out and saying, I'm having a great time. Mm-hmm. You know, they're talking about him staying next season, a bit coy on what exactly that'll be, whether it'll be another loan or maybe something a little bit more. It would have to rely on Rangers releasing him, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think that's what it's going to come to. I'd love to see him stay, and I think he'd be a great asset going forward. I think he's just a little bit different, just with that pace. And he's, he's got a goal. We know we know he can score. He's got a very vital goal for the team, so he's got that in his locker. I'd rather have him than not have him. Oh, definitely. I'd, I'd hate to see uh, him go back to Rangers and sit on the bench or sit in the reserves or probably even worse, go to Aberdeen, Hibs, Hearts, someone like that and, and, and perform well for them. I'm saying Hearts are going to be around us. They're shit, but that's... <laughs> that's, not that's by the by. And I just like the fact his name's Glenn. You don't see many young Glens these days, do you? You don't. Um, it's it's in there with the um, with the sort of lost, lost names to... Oh, people like Glenn. Don't see many Garys anymore. <laughs> got a couple of mates that are called Gary. Ezekiel. That's a name that's sort of gone out of fashion. <laughs> Very few Adolfs kicking around. <laughs> <laughs> So as you know, if you're a new listener, we the first 11 episodes we had a feature called Saint Stories where people sent in their, their Saint Stories, both funny, rude, ridiculous and everything in between, pretty much. So, but if you want something a bit more wholesome, Dan. Uh, you've got to do it. You've got, you've got to have the wholesomeness there. Well, I was thinking this week, Dan, about the club and what's the most wholesome thing you can think about St. Johnston? Elliot Parrish. <laughs> he was close. He was a close second behind the smile on a child's face. That's pretty wholesome. That is, that is wholesome. That's what, that's the root of football, isn't it? Indeed it is. And how do you put a smile on a child's face? <laughs> There's no good way of saying that. <laughs> no, no. The best way to put a smile on a child's face, Dan, is... <laughs> pies. P- pies is up there, yes. and Or have a mascot. Wave to them in the comfort of their seat at McDermott. It's become part of the whole game, hasn't it? And I'm saying that as if it's a recent thing. You know, mascots have been kicking about. You get them all, don't you? Um, Gunnosaurus. Hoopy the Huddle Hound. That weird thing at Partick Thistle. Oh, that's just disturbing. Fred the Red. Ah, oh, oh, Frederico. What's, I, what's the hammer at um, West Ham called? Herbie the Hammer. Herbie the Hammer. Brilliant. But St. Johnson have got Brogan the Beagle. He's Everyone great. likes that. Everyone does. He replaced Super Saint, which was a great mascot. And if you remember uh, the comic strips and the programs in the 90s, and I obviously do because I'm a big fan of the 90s. Oh, we do love the 90s. So we've we've tried hard to... to we've obviously got Danny, we've got Danny Griffin on later on, who will be absolutely superb, no question. But we've also managed to wrangle another special guest, Dan. We have indeed. And this is a special guest that's a little bit different. He is. He's a giant beagle. You've all seen where this is going by now, haven't you? <laughs> We've got the man behind the match day mascot. It's Jason. How you doing, mate? You all right? I'm great. How you all doing? 
Very well, thank you. So, as a match day mascot, tell us about your day. How does your match day go? Take you're not sitting down with the team, having the past in the hotel before <laughs> the match. How does your day roll? Uh, well, well, first of all, thanks for having me on your podcast. I, there's two podcasts I listen to re- religiously, and it's it's your podcast and uh, Off the Ball. So, my two favourite podcasts, and I'm out for a job. Thanks for even asking me on, man. Great, I really enjoy it. You can come um, on every week with that kind of patter. Well, that's what you told me to say at the start. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> I arrive at the club <laughs> at <laughs> half one usually uh, to go and get changed. Um, now everything I'm telling you is what used to happen. It's all going to change now. Um, then I'll go into the groundsman's office where the where Brogan is usually kept, and then I'll uh, take take a while to get into it. I then have to try and play the game of trying to line up the velcro of my fan, which is a two hand fans I have that go inside Rogan's nose to try and keep me cool it's uh, it's a DIY job I did myself but it's the only way to keep the uh, keep the you know not get too hot in the suit <laughs> no. while we're walking around I know I know humans die in hot dogs is what I say so I need to <laughs> <laughs> really really yeah so I'll line up these fans which can take a while and then I'll put the suit on and I'll usually chat to folk in the tunnel it's right outside the tunnel so there's loads of people walking past you know you've got Alec walking past who uh, always calls me Broxy uh, every week <laughs> never gets old every single week I, I love Alec he's absolutely brilliant um, always chat to him and then what we've got is we've got Kids Club that, uh, and that's brilliant again it's full of uh, loads of volunteers like myself who, who just go down and you've got a football match going on or there's drawing or there's um, there's FIFA now I'm I'm a big FIFA fan, so I always end up joining them with the as Rogan and playing them at FIFA <laughs> uh, and and, be, and beating them as well. So that's that's a lot of fun. Uh, but it's it's great. You see the same, you see you know roughly the same fans and the same parents that come down and the same volunteers every week. So I'm there for about 15 minutes. In fact, I'm usually there before two o'clock. So I'm there for a good half hour, 45 minutes. It depends how long I can last without sweating so much <laughs> that I need to go. And it always finishes with me going and goal and then they take penalties at me. I, I play better in goal as Brogan as I do as just in general. <laughs> so so that's that. And then I'll go outside and usually about quarter past two, there's still no one in the stadium yet. But I'll walk around the stadium anyway and wave to, you know, the security people, people bringing out the pies. Um, hmm. There'll be three or four fans there. I'll wave to them. They're usually about in their 40s, 50s and not up for it. So I'll leave it them anyway. <laughs> By 10 too, the players are coming off. So I'm usually waiting in the wings as the players come off. Um, you've got David Wotherspoon. He always, Spoonie always makes an effort to try and find me, to high five me. I think he's superstitious that he won't play well unless he high fives me. Um, so the players will come off and then once everyone's off, then that's when I'll come back out again and wave to people. Uh, it's really hard to see out of the suit. Um, so someone could be waving at you. Someone will say, "Oh, you didn't wave to my laddie the other week." I'm like, "I'm really sorry. I, <laughs> I, I generally cannot see them." But I'll, I so sometimes when you see me waving, I don't actually know who I'm waving to. <laughs> I, I just wave anyway. You know, I could be waving to an empty stand. I just keep on waving so I don't offend anyone. Now. <laughs> so that's uh, yeah. So that, that that's pretty much that's pretty much the routine. But I have to keep taking breaks because it is so so hot. I can't stress. I, I'm you know it's quite claustrophobic as well having the having that head on the whole time. And I do try and go around the stadium as much as I can. That's If I'm not there, it's because I'm having water. That, that's all it is. It's a water break. Um, that, that's <laughs> it. Ball. They, they put a bowl. They put a St. Johnston bowl on the floor. <laughs> Are you told to avoid the way end? Am I told to avoid the way ends? The away end, as in the... <laughs> 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 that's not getting caught. <laughs> uh, Wow. I've never, I've, ne- I've never been told not to do anything, but I just use my common sense, and yeah. uh, you know, I've, I've heard that, you know, from the, from the WhatsApp group of other mascots that there's, uh, you know, certain people that get fired. If you've got a full stand full of Celtic fans, I know fine well if I walk past them, even though there's one kid that might wave to you, it's not worth it because you're just going to no. get no. Do- dogs abuse as they say. <laughs> oh, you know, oh, hey. hey. You can come back. Uh, <laughs> I know. I used to do. I used to do um, a couple of super saints as well. You know, before Brogan, and I, I get. I got more abuse for being super saint than I did as, as Brogan. I think it's because they, they didn't really understand the story behind super saint and you know the fanzine and the comic and everything yeah. like that. So they didn't actually understand what he's all about. Whereas when you're a dog, then it's pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. You're a dog. We must. So, uh, we must have to stop you there because we both got very very excited. There's a WhatsApp group for football mascots. Yes, yeah, <laughs> there is. That is amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah, you've got like Kingsley coming in. He's blocked at the moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's always up to big freak. Yeah, it's, we've not got all. We've actually not got everyone in it yet. So um, actually, uh, there's. I'm, I'm good friends with. Uh, out of all of this, I'm come good friends with the the new Kilmarnock mascot, Ricky. He's a really good guy. He's Captain Conquer. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can re- reveal his name because it's uh, he, the BBC did a thing about him. Uh, but he's he's absolute class. Um, I've never actually met him, so uh, him and I are made up for a pint man. When we're able to, so yeah, I'm good, good friends with Captain Conquer, so no doubt we'll, we'll end up doing something together at some point. It's the fourth of Brady in this group, uh, not yet. Uh, like, like I said, it's, it's very early days. We, we're actually worried there's another WhatsApp group and we're just not invited to that. So, uh, <laughs> Brady will be big league in you because you got him a view from the terrace. All right, okay, okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, oh, why not? It's a, it's a cracking costume, to be honest. It's uh, yeah, there's, there's some great ones. I mean, the ones down south, I'm, I'm not too clued up, but what uh, there's the uh, the boiler, yeah, West Bromwich Albion, uh, the big boiler, yeah. That's oh yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, that's uh, that, yeah, that's. I don't think I can wear that. It's uh, <laughs> that must be really hot inside. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, no, it's, there's some cracking, cracking, uh, cracking costumes out there. So, but I'm happy with a beagle. We're super saying just now. Where is is he been binned? He's retired. He's still in the club. He's uh, he's uh, it's kind of like Craig Levine, really. He's still there. <laughs> just floats around. Not <laughs> don't know what really what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's there. He, he's there. He's um, it, yeah. He's, he's old. It, it's really old. The material's old. So it's yes. Yeah, it's, it's time to time to move on. I I mean I love Super Saint and uh, you know I love the history of Super Saint. Um, but yeah, I I think it's time for Brogan to shine now. I think yeah. So it's I I love doing the Brogan stuff. It's it's a, it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, you know what? The, the reason I do it is because um, it's the closest. Th- I'm I'm never going to be a professional footballer. I never came close right I'm terrible at football but it's the closest thing you can get to being a, fo- a professional footballer oh, is yeah. being a mascot because um, you know you, you come out with the team you stand in the lineup. you know I usually stand next to Murray Davidson um, and then it's me and then you go and well you won't do it anymore you used to go and shake hands with opposition players you know you get big stars of Celtic and Rangers and that coming and they always no one ever dinged me um, they always high five me at the end you know they, you know, they, they think I'm not high five in a, a mascot but I always got a high five off everyone all the Rangers players, all the Celtic players, we give you a high five, and then you go with the the actual wee mascots of, on of the day. You do the coin toss with them, and then you go off. Then you go and get changed, and then you watch the game, and no one knows what you've just done. Um, as you as you go to your seat five minutes late. Why is that guy soaking wet and sweating with two fans around his <laughs> neck? <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I hope you're going to be as excited as uh, we are to get back in the ground next year. I will. I'm in Norman Sand with my two boys, and they're always very excited to see Brogan the Beagle. Thanks for telling us all about your day and hopefully we'll see you at Big Demon very soon. Cheers, Jason. Thank you. Cheers. Well, Dan, not going to lie to you. If all our guests are as nice as him, I would have a mascot on every single week. Last week, I described myself as Perth's most wholesome character. That is true. I said this in good faith, but I have to retract that statement because I think Jason has blown me out of the water. What a nice, nice guy. If you want your own Brogan the Beagle, Dan, you can contact the club. They're selling them. Cute, cuddly toys. Oh, who wouldn't want that? The most wholesome toy in the world. That is a very wholesome toy. And it rounds off nicely a wholesome segment. But Uh-oh. it's always the flip side of the mascot. <laughs> Go on. And that is mascots doing minute silence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Twitter page. It's amazing. Uh, it's honestly, it's unbelievable. I've got a couple of favourites. There's a couple of... Because you know how the closest game to Armistice Day, basically, particularly with, like Premier League games, have been turned into some sort of military tattoo. Yeah. So it was a couple of years ago. It's Tottenham. I think they were playing at Wembley at the time. So they've got the whole row of like the military, like the bugle players and all that. Then creeping out from the back is Tottenham's mascot. So it's all very solemn and the heads were bowed. Creeping out from the back is Tottenham's mascot, who is an anaphomorphic chicken <laughs> or cockerel. That's his big grin on his face, <laughs> and he's like striding about. The backstory to uh, Minute Silent mascots is the fact that obviously they've got a painted on smile on their face and during the Minute yeah. Silences they're, they're stood in the centre circle with the players just standing there with their heads bowed but they still have a massive cheesy grin on their face and that's, that's what makes it so funny. It's amazing. The best one of that particular sort of, you know, players, 11 players and then the mascot on the end, uh, we'd have to go to Fleetwood Town. Okay. Who have they got as their mascot? Uh, Captain Cod. He's <laughs> um, <laughs> just... Stood at the end. Is he a fish or a fisherman? Sorry? Is he a fisherman? No, he's a fish. <laughs> <laughs> of course he is. Cod. 
<laughs> the best thing I've ever seen with Captain Cod, I'm going to wind this up now, but I've gone to a game. So Captain Cod's been doing his rounds of the grounds. He's giving it all, giving it all big belting and all that. By the time the fifth goal went in, it's just this angry Fleetwood fan, like kicking cardboard cups along the ground. But he's still got this big grin on his face. He's still got the head on. <laughs> <laughs> incredible brilliant the world of football mascots so we have to thank jason as well for coming on chatting about broken the beagle and what a great job he does ah uh, fantastic but we must move on we have another we, we have another guest oh, oh we are spoiling you this is what we decided then we're just going to get people on so you don't need to listen to us for an hour and a half yeah we're like um the people who carry around the ferrero roche at the ambassador's reception <laughs> we are indeed and the guests are like the ferrero roche themselves I've lost it today. <laughs> you I really? Yeah, uh, I do like a Fredo Rossi though. Oh, you can't beat him. We are spoiling you, as the ambassador once did as well at that party. <laughs> 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 but our guest is in the top fifteen greatest saints of all time, according to the Alistair Blair book Hagiography. That means the study of saints. Clever title. Maybe too clever for the likes of us, Dan. Speak for yourself, fella. <laughs> I was the one who told Alistair. I was said to him. I said, Larry. Hagiography, you'll sell a million. <laughs> Next guest joined the club at 15 years old and he is still there to this day. Yeah, an absolutely tremendous servant to St. Johnston. Um, as you said, Sam, a fantastic player once upon a time and now uh, helping the club's coach inside in the, in the community. Indeed he is. There's not much more we can say that we won't talk about with him. Former Northern Ireland international, St. Johnston defender and club legend, Danny Griffin. Good evening. Hello, how are you doing? You all right? Evening, mate. I'm not too bad just so. Very well, thank you very much for coming on. Not a problem, thanks for inviting me. Um, how's Easter? Busy, busy? Very busy. I bet. Very busy. Knowing that we've had the holiday camps with the kids, with the community stuff, yeah, it's it's been busy, which is great. Brilliant. Well, we'll Long may it continue. Indeed, we'll start with that. Um, tell us about your role in Perth in the community. My role is the community club development officer Damn. within the community working under Athel Henderson. Um, everybody knows Athel's done the community set up for years on end, doing all the community football, different projects that we do. Um, and I got a chance of the opportunity of working with the community and I was really lucky to be in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up getting a job. So for the last possibly nine years now, I've been in doing all the football side of things that Athel used to do, organising different projects, running different projects helping really within the whole Perth and Kinross area. But you've got many strings to your bow, Danny. Co-coms. Yes. Yeah. As I've always said, the co-coms is great. It's, an, it's a pleasure of getting the opportunity for the, get asked for to do it um, because I'm one of only a few that gets to watch a live football game. And I feel privileged knowing that, yeah, I'm getting the chance to see it, but it, it's trying to make it exciting for the fans. It's either watching and listening. I'm just a fan at the end of the day. I came here when I was 15 to St. Johnson, so it's my it's been my family ever since. Indeed, you're, uh, we'll touch on most of this later on, but we'll have to ask who's better, Watty or Guidi? Um, I'd say Watty. You're on on Saturday with Mark, are you not? I'm on on Saturday, yeah. Uh, if you keep on interrupting every time you decide to spell out Flonix, yeah. and uh, seems to spell out everything the guy. Oh, I, I said the other day, we were doing the walking football on Monday night with some of the guys, and they were chatting about the game coming on Saturday. And I says, guys, I'm just going to start spelling things. <laughs> I'm going to like whoever's on the ball. It's Gordo, G-O-R-O-D-O. -O. Oh, it's Booney, S-P-O-O-N-Y. <laughs> um, but I think if I did that, they wouldn't invite me back. Yeah, well, a whole like, couple of games to go anyway. But um, I don't think he's a fan's choice well, between us, I don't think. But No, speaking to some of the fans, they don't because of the advertising that he does but I can understand why he's doing it because he'll be getting told to do it by the club Yeah, and I know that the, the year the club have had without fans and I know they aren't the, well, the best supported team with the fans that's there but they've lost out in quite a bit even though they've won the League Cup final and yeah. the money makes up for it a little bit but they've still lost out and I know why Mark's been doing it a lot because he will be getting told yeah, he can man. do it until his heart's content oh, ex from now on we're, spon we're sponsoring um we're sponsoring Elliot Parrish's shirt, so yeah, he's more, more than welcome to give us a bit of a bit of <laughs> If he does it on Saturday, I'll look at him and say, "Is he not sponsored by somebody?" <laughs> That's it. We've, we could have picked a player with a more active role, to be fair, but oh, we'll, we'll do. We're slim pickings by this time of the season. <laughs> be honest with you. How long have you had it for? 
Uh, we How long have been if he's taken the sponsorship? Oh, yeah, like two days ago, just this week. But then that's none you guys have sponsored him. And that is money in the club's pocket, knowing that there only has a few games left. Exactly right. So yeah. well done, you guys, for doing it, knowing that it helps the club a little bit. And Elliot Parrish has been delighted as well. He's wanting us to go down to the NFL with us in London and play cricket in the, the Mutant Suite with him. And, oh, he's been great since, uh, since we told but then, him. But <laughs> That's what you want, though. It's That's what the players should be like, knowing that somebody's sponsoring them. Yeah. Is show that interest and the appreciation of, thanks very much for that, guys. That, yeah, what can I do for you guys, knowing that you're doing this for me? Exactly right. Well, that's kind of how we started this podcast. One, lockdown. Two, I've got the equipment here. And three, there's nothing really kind of like this out there for St. Johnson fans that are kind of like an in-between. I know what Bev does is absolutely incredible for the club. And uh, obviously the Saints in the community stuff as well. Yep. And um, But this is just a kind of another medium to kind of keep in, keep in touch with the fans and uh, keep it linked with the club and stuff. So it's... Of course it is, yeah. And it's the best way forward for everybody to go, knowing that you guys, yeah, have a bit of fun with it, get people on. Um, and I know you've had, I think the last one that you did was Big Kearney. Yeah. He's, he's a good guy. Uh, he's, he's a, a good really guy. nice fella. Yeah, really nice fella. He, he's, we had to, he had to stop the interview three or four times to go get another glass of wine, but nah, he can do what he wants, to be fair. That's not like him. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. But uh, we'll, we'll go back. Obviously, you came over to St. John's when you were 15, playing in Belfast. How did the move originally... Yep come in the first place Alistair Stephen was one of the youth academy he was the head of youth at Rangers under with him and a boy John Chalmers mm-hmm. and I used to go to Rangers every time I was off school from about the age of 13 okay. even not just Rangers I was all over the place um, at different clubs um, and when Alistair left to come to the St. Johnson for to be on his own head of youth I was playing for the Northern Ireland schoolboy team and then a skilling against Wales and when I got there, I was thinking, how's my mum and dad here? My mum and dad don't drive. And I went over and I spoke to them and they were like, how did you get here? And I went, oh, Alistair picked us up when he landed at the airport. <laughs> and he says, oh, why is Alistair here? And he says, oh, he's taking you with him tomorrow morning. You're going to Scotland for 10 days. Um, and ended up at St. Johnson for 10 days. John McClellan was the manager at the time. Mm-hmm. Did the 10 days and went back home. And then after about a fortnight, I think I got a call from Alistair saying with a sign. At the age of 14, 15, then I said, yeah, jump with the chance. And then ended up across the water. There you were, but there was plenty of kind of young youth players breaking in at that time. Obviously, there was you, there was Fizzy, there was Stuart McCluskey, Andy Whiteford, um, all good yep. solid defenders. Andy Kier, Whiteford. Yeah, Kieran Mac and Espy. Um, we have, we've had him on first episode. I think he wants to actually be part of it, I think. He keeps yeah. on badgering on. I think he wants to be a co-host, I think. Maka was into everything, yeah. Do you keep in touch with any of these boys? Um, I speak to Fizzy the odd occasion over like Instagram. And it's the same with Kieran. It's like Facebook. I think when Kieran did the co-coms at one of the games, I think it was Motherwell, I was messaging him during the co-coms and having a giggle with him. Yeah, just the odd occasion, just the, the odd message between each other. Uh, Fizzy's very kind of aloof on social media. He's on Instagram, but that seems to be that seems to be it. He actually takes... he's just he's just new to it. He is. He's he's, get, he's getting the hang of it. It's well, he is. He's been posting all the old pictures. I know, but... which is great to see because he posted one of the pictures where it was like Fizzy, me, Stuart, Andy Whiteford, Kieran, Mike, and Espy all in an international strips. Yeah, and that. I was rolling back the years. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'd love to know where he's getting them all. I know he must have a scrap. He's got a box of uh, stuff. He said he didn't throw it any than any newspaper clipping. He, he kept same as his old kit. He's got box yeah. and box of old kits. Because we were talking about the teal magenta away kit, and the first thing he did was I could have put it yeah. on. I've got. He's got. He's got it. Have you still got yours? I've got all mine. I've got all mine as well. As you can see, there's one behind me, the international jersey. But all my all my stuff's in the loft. All right. We went to play Italy in Sicily. Um, Tommy Wright actually played that game. We, we beat two 0 um, Tommy was in goal as well so yeah that's one of my favourite ones because that's the LPR's at least trip Nice how does that work with uh, switching shirts at the end of the game do you just kind of keep an eye on the clock and just hang around the player you kind of to be fair I think I run after him for about 20 minutes near the end of the game making sure I was going to get it um, <laughs> yeah I think it's just whoever you're closest to really that you just think that, right, who can I get you know that you're going to be playing a couple of days before and you're looking at it right who can I try to get close to um, I think in that game the boy Jerry Tiger, a big centre half, yeah, it was yeah. at Leicester. Leicester yeah. The first half was Casa Raggi and Zola for the first two strikers in the first 45 minutes. Then they changed it to Del Piero and Revanelli. <laughs> and, 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 and Jerry Tiger ended up man marking Revanelli for the 45 minutes because that's the strip that he wanted. And it's not, it's not being shy about it, it's just going up to them and saying, right, can I get you a strip? Um, so, yeah, it's no matter who I was playing against, I always wanted to ask. Mm-hmm. Because I was brought up, if you don't ask, you don't get. Absolutely right. So yeah, I've got, I've, 
I've got a few. I've got another Italy one that's in the loft upstairs. We played them in a special game where there was a, a volcano erupted in Italy and a, it was a young primary school that got hit first. Um, and they wanted to play us for some odd reason. I don't know if they were trying to get their confidence high after it, choosing a, <laughs> a low-ranked country at the time. Um, and they beat us 2-0. And I got Ambrosini's top. But I had to walk straight into the changing room and ask because they weren't doing it on the pitch. Right. And bold as brass me, just walked in, opened the door, and went, guys, can I get that? <laughs> and your boots and so, a bottle of that wine as well, please. Yeah, can, yeah. can, I, get, can I get them shorts? <laughs> that's right. you, can keep the, you can keep the underwear, but I'll take the shorts. Well, touch, Full strip. That's it. You are, obviously, you, you played through a load of memorable games. Uh, we'll touch on three of them. I, I kind of went through the archives, and you've probably talked to me these till you're blue in the face, but probably the ones fans most want to hear. Uh, well, we'll touch on one. It's probably not one you probably remember too fondly. Challenge Cup final of 1996-97. I, I, can, I can remember it well. I bet. One of a few Saints players that's gone a cup final. Well, there you go. And, and a fine strike it was. I think the footage is circulating on YouTube, finally, the full match. Um, I watched it back not too long ago. And oh, it's a, it's a great finish. That, that's outstanding. Main didn't stand a chance. but No, nah, no chance. Apart from one, the weather was absolutely honking all day. It was garbage. Yep. Uh, it was torrential. Yep. Yeah, uh, the last 10 minutes, it was Sonara back to the wall stuff. He could have easily equalised and if not won it after that. But what would, what did what did Luggy say after the match about about that? It, was, it, was, it wasn't after the match. It was at half time. He just asked me, what the fuck did I do that for? <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. I, 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 as, if I, as if I meant it. Um, <laughs> Had myself on first goal scorer. He never really said more. I don't know. <laughs> I think he was just disappointed knowing it was a chance of silverware, knowing, and it wasn't to be because I think there was like a big party and that up at the Westerwood Hotel straight mm. after it. And that was just when Sky Sports was getting going and we were sitting in the Westerwood Hotel after it and everybody's got the sad face on, knowing that they just did not want to be there. And it comes along the tickety tape of Sky Sports that, yes, Johnson can beat 1 0 by Strand and it's an on goal by Danny Griffin. Yeah, but, but you're, you're one of the very few people that have been involved with the club for what, four cup finals? That you were at the League Cup final. I don't think you were in the team that day, but that was Sandy Clark. No, we'll touch on I that. was sitting in the stand. We'll, yes. We'll touch on that later. You're also part of the Scottish Cup final in 2004 and for 2021. There can't be many folk that have been on the, for all of them. No, it's, it's nice to be in a situation where you were, like the, the Challenge Cup final scoring, and it was actually my wife picked up on one day a few years ago when somebody was saying about it, um, I've scored an own goal in a cup final when we could beat. I've had serious injuries. I've had managers that hasn't liked me, so I've had to move on to different clubs. And there's always that saying that you've been there, done it, and worn a T-shirt. I literally have. No one does a. Do you think of a 17-year-old scoring? In a cup final, they could beat 1-0. Some of them would have collapsed, knowing that their career could have been over there that day. Exact opposite. But no one, else, no. Yeah, knowing that it was always going to... And it was always... A few people turned around and said that that, that was the year we won the league. Mm -hmm. That it was a blessing in disguise where we got promoted, that it drove us on for to win the league. That's yeah, it would have been nice to do the double, but we didn't do it. Um, but for to go and get promoted was absolutely terrific. Yeah, just to actually touch on that, because obviously he's such a young... Young lad at the time, Danny. Obviously, the disappointment at a cup final and and whatnot. But taking that to one side, how much of a buzz was it going through that league season? It's like you say, seventeen year old. It was great. Seventeen, eighteen, going through that league season and ending up in promotion. And being it was great and knowing, yeah, because you you experienced players in the team. Um, and I think halfway through the season as well, Stuart McCluskey and I developed a partnership playing together at centre half, knowing that the experienced ones was out injured. And Main, Main Stewart had played the gala for a long time. Like Stewart was at Rangers as well. And when I used to come across and play at weekends, actually for St. Johnson, Stewart was there. I used to stay with Stuart McCluskey for the weekends and stuff and play for the St. Johnson under 15, 16s. So we had a partnership that was great. So when we were in the youth team together, things were actually going really well for the two of us. And it was just going to be a toss of a coin who he was going to play. So the week before I made my debut, Stuart made his. And I was raging about it. <laughs> But it, what it was for the season, for the go the way it did, for to get a chance, for to put my name on the starting eleven for as much as it did, and for to go and get promotion, it was absolutely fantastic. The second game I want to touch on is the the seven two game. It's yep. still everybody's favourite game, I would say, by a by a country mile. Everybody who spoke to about it have mentioned the same thing. You give away a penalty, John Blackley loses his teeth. Jerry O'Driscoll, I take him down in the box. <laughs> 
Was that and John Blackley? Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> John Blackley's absolutely berating me from the dugout, knowing that we're winning seven one at the time. That's just a silly challenge of me trying to win the ball in the box, and if the referees give a penalty, and he's just started, and supposedly his false teeth have come out and landed on the track. <laughs> And he's went out and picked them up and dusted them off, put them in and still carried on shouting at me. <laughs> I'd imagine it'd be a bit like when you take your boots off in the Astro and all the little black pellets come out. I'd imagine that's what it'd be like when he took his teeth out at night. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'll be all in me bits of gravel. <laughs> the, the goals were flying in. Like Lee Jenkinson was unplayable that day. That Every time you scored, the fans were shouting, we want four, we want five, we want six. And then, excuse me, when it went to seven, you're thinking, wow. I know. And then me... The dafty here gives away a penalty and <laughs> they give some of the Dundee fans a chance to cheer about it, but it was more the Saints fans that cheered about it knowing that they had a chance to score. <laughs> I think there was about two fans left in the stand by that point. I think most of them had cleared off back <laughs> up the road. Out, yeah. <laughs> uh, they're all back in trades by then. <laughs> two more matches we'll touch on. Again, Dundee again. We're on the top flight. Sandy's in charge now and we finished third. We needed Kelly to drop points. I think they were rain- playing Rangers. We were playing Dundee. Paul Last Kane- game of the season. Yeah. Paul Kane. Paul Kane scores. Yes. Alan Main does something I've never seen happen again. Uh, and it's my fault that he has to do it. Oh, is it? Did you lose If you actually watch it. It's, yeah, if you actually watch it, James Grady runs off me. Yeah, okay. And Alan Main, become, Alan Main becomes Superman. Frightening. And touches it over the bar. Um, yeah, knowing that we knew what the result would be for us, knowing that if Kelly never got a result, we'd never have thought in a million years that would have got third spot. I think it was every year when we were starting off the season, it was always stay in the SPL or stay in the Premier League, knowing that that's, that was the bread and butter. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you go through and you've got a chance of making third spot. And Keno comes up with a header by Rob Douglas and the place just goes absolutely mental. And then you're waiting and waiting and waiting and then Alan Main makes a save right at the death. And then it goes, the final whistle goes. We have won the game and you're waiting on the result and all of a sudden it feeds through that you've made the third spot and we've made Europe and it still gives you goosebumps sitting thinking about it now. Yeah. Um... And then at that time I thought it would never ever have been done again but what do I know when they've done it six times in a bunch? <laughs> and, they've, they've done, <laughs> and again, chance for chance for this season again, but we'll touch on that later. Yes. And the last one match I'll touch on is the the following season. The result of that third place was a UEFA Cup game. Qualified through the preliminaries against VPS Vasov, Finland. And then you got yes. Monaco. That's not a bad time. Ridiculous. It was, it, was, it was Monaco or West Ham. Was that who the choice was, was it? I didn't that's, realize that's West what Ham. it was going to be. Yeah, West Ham were there and we were sitting in the players' lounge and we were thinking, West Ham or Monaco. And we'd already played West Ham. We'd played West Ham in like a pre season friendly, not just long before that. <laughs> oh, we've done them. No playing them again. We've done them already. No, and that's, yeah, you're sitting <laughs> thinking that going, oh, you're, you're thinking of Monaco being one of the big highlight teams. At, the, as, at that time, they were. And, it can, and all of a sudden, we're drawn away to Monaco. And you go, wow. This is going to be great. And we did have a chance because we kept them quiet for 70 minutes. And Miguel had three one-on-ones with Bartes. Saved all three. And I think, and... Yeah. And I think that possibly their better quality of players showing a wee bit more. And I think Tarnas kicked in with us knowing that we were backs against the wall for so long. And they ended up beating us 3-0. No, it was never. But it's like the funny story about that was yet again Sandy Clark um, when I said about swapping shirts as you said we were told we weren't allowed to swap shirts because it was the only strip we had for the European games and everybody's like but we might not might not play the home game so I'm going to miss out and it was like well if you swap a shirt you've got to buy a new one and you're fined and I think straight after the game everybody swapped <laughs> fuck it I'll pay it for the kit the Monaco strip no I'm like, the because you never you were never going to get a chance if you weren't going to be playing the home game no and that team looking back it was absolutely packed full. Packed full of Brimwood stars. Trezeguet, Bartes, John Anarisa, Perzo, the lot, Marquez, the... Simeone. Simeone it, was, yeah. it was ridiculous. Julie. Julie went to Barcelona. Yeah. The wee winger. Aye. Incredible. You played the home game as well, didn't you? The three-all game. Yes. Yeah, that yeah. was... Um, and it was... That was possibly, going back a couple of years ago when they've been in Europe, that that was the last time they conceded three goals in Europe that was a record for them that we were the only team that do it then whereas now they have conceded a few but that was the first time that they conceded three goals in Europe any time they've played that's brilliant and a good start I didn't know that mm, yeah good quiz question I, I think so I'm noting it down as we speak but we do bit... like a start on here Oh, we do like a stat. We do like talking about the 90s. That's one of our big things. So it's uh, you're, you're, you're right up our street, Danny. Um, 
We've touched on Sandy Clark a couple of times. We've spoken to a lot of guests. Yes. Um, Sandy Clark genuinely didn't seem the most popular guy. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, we all found it strange how quick he came in after Luggy left to go back to United. We always knew that the deal was done for Luggy before. Mm -hmm. that, that was one of the part of the deal that he, they were doing after they signed him that when Dundee United came calling he was come back because it happened all of a sudden where Luggy went and then Sandy was in the following day I would possibly say there was 90% of them didn't like him what was, what was that down to? Just is it man management? just tactics? Um, possibly knowing that when he came in he walked into a team that was already there mm -hmm. it was formed it didn't have to be changed because before Loggy had left, I'm pretty sure that Loggy did one of the meet the manager nights. I think it was a couple of years that he had just been there. And I think one of the fans had asked him a question and he says, no, give me five years and I'll have this team fighting for further up the league position. They'll be fighting for the Cups. They'll be doing this and they'll be doing that. And I think it was the fifth year that Loggy had set. That's the fifth year that Loggy left. Mm -hmm. So Loggy had built the team um, and we were flying. We were, I think we got to the quarterfinal of the Scottish Cup, whatever, the League Cup. We were high up the league at that time the one that he had left so everything that Luggy had said it happened and then Sandy came in tried to change it when it wasn't really needing change like he, he spent a bit of cash Sandy when you think about it like Jeff gave him a bit of cash like bringing John Paul McBride in from Celtic Martin Lachlan Jim Lachlan's younger brother yeah, yeah. Paddy Conley um, Paddy Conley knowing that he did spend a bit of cash and he just tried to upset the apple cart a wee bit too much. When you're playing Paul Kane and Nick Dazovich in the middle of a park, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And he tried to play John Paul McBride and taking Kane out or taking Nick out. And it just didn't seem to work with everybody. And it, it just got to the stage where people were like, what's the point? Yeah, it's a point you've just hit on there, really. It wasn't so much... Well, it's sort of a combination. There was the amount of money spent and players bought in. It was also guys going the other way. It was... Yeah. The turnover. I mean, was it almost a ripple of ripple effects? Obviously, Fizzy went. He yeah, went down Kieran, on Wednesday. Yeah, Kieran, Kieran went left. Down I left. You went. I went to United. Yeah. Um, Alan Mayan left and went to Livingston. Yeah. John and Neil left and went to Hibs. So it's that's what I mean about it. Like, I'd have stayed it since my whole career if it hadn't been for him. Um, knowing that it got to the stage where I was playing and then I wasn't playing. I was a bit part player. And I knew my contract was coming to an end and it got to the stage where I was like, do I really want to be here under him? And everybody was possibly the same. Yeah, they got a bit of money for Fizzy. They got money from me. Alan Main walked out the door. John and Neil went to Hibs on a free. Keith O'Halloran left and went to Swindon. There was a lot of players that actually went out the door knowing that they just thought, well, if he's changing it this way and he doesn't see me being part of it, I'm out of here. And he dismantled a good team because it's the team that got third spot. Sandy takes a lot of credit thinking it was him. Far from it. Mm -hmm. It was Luggy. It was his team, in it? Oh, by far. By far. Um, knowing that he had built it, he had brought in the players he wanted. He wanted the players to play in a certain way, which they did. They went and expressed themselves. But they could also muck, it, muck in, knowing it was a wee bit nasty mm -hmm. at that time, the way the game is. We could look after ourselves. Whereas with Sandy, it was like, do you really? No, I'm not, uh, not playing with him. He's, he's not doing it for me. And it just got to the stage where everybody was like, if I get a chance in my way. Yeah. Um, we've heard that we, we wouldn't name particulars but a few of the, the guys we've spoke to have said that they were just kind of dropped and not given any explanation why And but the, the players that came, came in absolutely no offence to them but they weren't of the same quality the, the ones he was bringing in his guys that he was bringing in weren't of the same quality as the, that was already at the club But yeah and it's like for one job Paul McBride the ability that the boy had was incredible mm -hmm. absolutely like frightening ability but when it came to work rate of playing John Paul McBride or Paul Kane or Nick Dazovich or Attila, knowing that three guys would run through a brick wall, we could get the ball down and play. And when you're going through a rough patch in the game and your back's against the wall, say IE against Rangers or Celtic and John Paul McBride playing, you're playing with 10 men because he wouldn't work back. Yet again, get him on the ball and he would do something for you. But it just wasn't happening like that. And Sandy, as I said, dismantled a really, really, really good for to try to put his mark on a St. Johnson team that didn't really work. Nope. Yeah, I mean, the thing is as well, you sometimes look at when a manager comes in and dismantles a team, you know, maybe it's a team growing old together or whatever, but you, you guys were all in your peak. I know Biscuits, obviously, and Fizzy, unfortunately, succumbed to injuries at a young age. Yeah. A lot of you, and Kieran got a follow me on the rise, but a lot of you guys were really at your peak. Everybody was trying their hardest on, knowing yeah. that they, they, they bought into the plan that Paul Sturrock had brought in. As I said, he, he, he wanted players in that he knew could play his way. And for to do that and then leave as he did, 
and I get Sandy coming in and thinking, right, I'm going to change this up. I'm going to make this my team. I'm going to get them to do what I want. It backfired on him a wee bit in my eyes because it was, as you said, some of the guys have said, you would be dropped and all of a sudden you'd be like, well, I'm a dropped. I haven't done anything. It, it happened to me. I played against Hibs at Easter Road and I'm one of the, the few that I know when I play well and I know when I play bad. I, I don't need to look at a paper and say, oh, I've got a nine or I've got an eight or at that time I got the three stars in the PA. I knew when I played well and when I played bad and I thought I played really well against Hibs in the following week. I was out the team and I'm like why what have I done but you would never ever get the explanation the, the team spirit as you touched on there uh, you can certainly see the similarities within the Saints team at the moment or even over the last seven eight years is that the the main reason that this team has been so successful is it the spirit it's the it's, Sam it's the, it's the mentality of the football club I think it's witnessing that as a young boy when I come here as 15 and as I said Paul started coming in and bringing the players that he wanted he built a foundation of the type of player coming into St. Johnson wasn't a flair player. Mm -hmm. It was a workman-like player. They rolled their sleeves up. Yeah, they could play, but they were still willing to rough it with anybody in the league. And that I think that foundation of luggy building, as we said, Sandy's come in and dismantled it a bit. Other managers have come in and tried to replace it a little bit. And the one that possibly has, I would say, is Tommy Wright, knowing that he's brought in workman-like players, got the best out of them, and for to do what Tommy has done as a manager with the squad he had and the budget he had and people buying into what the club is, it is a family club, don't get us wrong, and it is the Brown family that run it. Everybody's there for to help each other. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've said it so many times, yeah, I work for the community department, I've, play, I've played it since. I'm always willing if any of the youngsters in the youth academy need to have a chat, they're struggling with something or they can't do this. Pretty sure there's other get Roddy's there as well, knowing that if we ever need to have a chat with anybody, that's what the club was then. And I think it lost that under Sandy, but it's come back big time knowing that they've just went on the League Cup with seven of players that came through the youth academy. Which is an unbelievable start. How far can these guys go? Oh, the sky's the limit. It depends how much they really want to do it. And it's it's going to be a tough decision for the club because at times I think they sell the players on too cheap. And no disrespect to any other player, one that jumps out is Scott McKenna that goes to Knott's Forest for £7 million. I'm sorry. But if we have got a bid that's coming in for Liam Gordon, McCart, Jason Kerr, I'm I'm looking for in the million pound plus. Yeah, has to knowing be. that we don't sell them on the cheap. Stevie May was sold on the cheap for me, knowing he was banging in goals. Did it work for him? Unfortunately, it did. And for financially, possibly for him, but for his injury, no. And now he's back at Saints, trying to get his his game back up to the level he was. The young ones, it's like Ali McCann. Ali McCann is flying at the minute. And for the miss out on the Young Player of the Year last year was embarrassing in my eyes. And it's very likely that will probably happen again this year. Yeah, and it will, because they'll look at somebody bigger. Like, I made the point last year when they were playing, when Tommy was the manager, watching them against Celtic at McDermott Park, and Neil Lennon was still the manager at the time. If I had been Neil Lennon at the time, going in and having a beer with Tommy in his office, I'd have done a deal there and then for Ali McCann for a fill the void of Scott Brown. Then they've went and got Turnbull. Who will probably get the Young Player of the Year. Possibly, because he's playing at Celtic. So why should players that play at St. Johnson get overlooked? And Callum was one of the ones as well when he was overlooked for Scotland because he was playing for, Norman, or playing for St. Johnson. And then all of a sudden he gets his move to Blackburn and he's in the squad right away. Well, we can... How many times can we say that? Stevie May, same thing, moves away, gets capped. Um, yep. Over the last 10 years, 11 years, we've had Murray Davidson get a wee cameo appearance against Luxembourg as the only yep. player to get a cap in the last 10 years, which is an absolute sin. But It's crazy. And it's I know Steve Clark has come out and acknowledged because I think he was questioned about this other players coming. And it's the likes of Andy Considine. Andy, Andy Considine has done great for Aberdeen. He's been a great servant to Aberdeen. And he gets the call up to Scotland and fills that hole the way any player would because you've grabbed it with two hands. It's an honour to play for your country. He's now part of that squad that could go to the Euros, knowing that he's got his chance at 34-year-old. But I think Steve has to look maybe at a couple of younger ones knowing that it's going to go in and play against the experience, play with the experienced players at that level so they understand what it's like and what they've got to do and how they've got to do it. Whereas if he just builds right from the work right at the bottom, it'll be tough again for Scotland. But I think our guys deserve a crack. Obviously, Ali, Mc, Ali McCann has been absolutely superb. I think I've watched every single game he's played for Northern Ireland. I actually watched uh, your game against Republic of Ireland earlier on on YouTube. You might have well scored an absolute screamer as well. Oh, it's a fluke. It's a fluke. <laughs> oh, you're too modest. <laughs> oh, honestly, Sam, it's I can I can remember it clear as day. 
it was I wasn't even in the squad to start with. I wasn't even acknowledged in the squad. I wasn't even chosen. Laurie Mc Laurie McManaman was the manager. Joe Jordan was the assistant manager, and Pat Jennings was the goalie coach. So you're looking at Paddy Englishman, Potty Scratchman, and Paddy English or Paddy Irishman, the three in charge. <laughs> it, was, it was a joke at the time. <laughs> Um, it, I wasn't even involved I was getting organised to go away on holiday with the missus and out of the blue I got a phone call from Laurie McManaman saying we're struggling with a few injuries can you make the squad and I says yeah when and he says if you book a flight today the game's on Wednesday or whatever Saturday afternoon it'd be great if you could be and I says right I'll book the flight and I'm on my way and I just dropped everything and I went and I was on the bench at Lansdowne Road because it was for the Oma Bowman and we were sitting on the bench, lovely afternoon, and all of a sudden he sent me and Aaron Hughes out for a do a warm-up because there was a few of the guys struggling. And then he called the two of us in. He says, right, the two years are going to go on. One years need to go on at left back and one needs to go in centre mid. And I've went, I'll go centre mid. So I come on for Neil Lennon and Aaron Hughes come on for Peter Kennedy, I think, at left back. And five minutes into the game, it was just, you've seen it yourself. It's a slide tackle 50-50. And I think I just get there first and it seals over Shea Given's head. One of a few players to score against the Republic of Ireland in a, in a derby match, which was great, knowing that we win 1-0. Brilliant. And that strip was on the wee boys wall next door framed yeah a memento you will keep for a long time a couple more questions I know you're in the middle of your Easter training so you'll be oh, sorry. were you 8 in the morning till what dusk oh no I was in I was in this morning taking nursery kids I had 15 nursery kids this morning <laughs> how's that so I was kept on my toes It was. It, it's great fun it's great fun knowing that as long as they come with a big smile on their face and enjoy it and go home with a smile on their face I'm happy brilliant I just become at their age yeah. If it's a three-year-old class I'm taking, I become three-year-old because then I've got to try to think of what a three-year-old's going to like. Eating crayons? <laughs> well, it all depends. <laughs> depends on the colours. <laughs> That's it. We'll finish up with, obviously, the one the Cup. Did you go at the League Cup final? No, because it was only a, man, of a few that was meant to be there. So it was just the, the privileged ones knowing that there was only so many. Oh, okay. I sat and watched it in the house with the family. I think it was just before they scored. My daughter got a text message from somebody saying that they'd scored. And I'm like, no, they haven't. No, they haven't. It's not. Oh, they've scored. <laughs> oh, and it just nothing worse. that point. So they've just killed it for us. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a, a great, great knowing sitting with the family because we did it with the Scottish Cup final in 2014. Um, that it was... Me, the wife, the two kids, the mother-in-law all went to the Scottish Cup final. And it was just a shame we couldn't do it this time. But with lockdown and the COVID situation, That's we had it. to do it in their own homes. But yeah, a fantastic achievement for them. Chuffed to bits. Um, knowing how much Callum and his backroom staff have worked with the players for to get to that stage and for to go and win it. And then a couple of weeks later, you get top six. Is a, an incredible achievement in his first year as manager. Exactly. Well, you're obviously quite pally with him. You kind of played in the same team together. How, how far can Callum go? Oh, yeah, again, it's the same as the players. Yeah. If you actually think of how Callum has gone about his work, being assistant to Tommy, he gets called in by Gordon Strachan with the SFA for the help. Gordon Strachan mm. rates him highly. He moves down south with Gary Rickett or Gary Rowett right, um, yeah. at Stoke it didn't work at Stoke he goes to Dunfermline under Stevie Crawford to give him a hand all of a sudden turns Dunfermline around defensively and then all of a sudden he ends up back down at Millwall and I think when the job opportunity came when Tommy decided for a step down I think it was only going to be one person that gets it and he's come in and he's changed it a little he's wanted to play his way he wants the players to do certain things and he's admitted that he's stuck to his game plan a lot of managers would have changed he's playing three at the back with the two wide ones and they're some of the football that they're playing is absolutely phenomenal and long may it continue speaking of managers well we'll touch on tommy wright a great manager for saints one i feel a wee bit sorry for because he obviously had probably had his heart set on the northern ireland job uh, never came through and now he's at Carl yeah, Marnock obviously he has to be has to be working to be considered for a job but is that somebody else that should have been at a higher position? Yes I think as I said that the years that he spent at Saints he came in as assistant manager to Steve Lomas Lomas moved to Millwall even though yet again Axe Hammer didn't work out and Tommy says he wasn't going so he got the job at Saints he built on the foundation as I said the whole way through of getting Saints to play a certain way the workmen like the way they used to be and I think at the time when he resigned, I'm saying resigned, um, I think he had it in his head he was going to get the Northern Ireland job. Mm -hmm. And he always said that. The only way he was going to leave St. Johnson is if Northern Ireland came along or Steve would sack him. And I think deep down, when the Northern Ireland job was there, I think, and this is just my way of thinking, yep. he's went to Steve and going, look, I've got two years left at St. Johnson. The Northern Ireland job's here. I'll resign now. You don't have to pay me a penny. But if Northern Ireland appoint me as manager, 
you don't get a penny, if you know what I mean, because if Northern Ireland had to come in and they've they paid out two years for mm. Tommy's contract, mm -hmm. and I think they've probably went, oh, yeah, that sounds good, yeah, and it hasn't happened. I think he's been sitting, possibly praying a little bit that it wouldn't work for Ian Barraclough, knowing that he's taking the step from the under-21s into the senior team. It didn't work for Mullerwell with Ian Barraclough when he was there as manager. The fans are starting to get a wee bit grouchy with Northern Ireland, knowing that the results aren't the best. Mm -hmm. And then the Kelly job comes and he takes the Kelly job. And I, I'm thinking this is another thing that is just me with my idea. He was probably got it that he's taking it, knowing that Derek McInnes got the sack. Because that would that would have been no disrespect to St. Johnson, but a bigger club in Aberdeen that are always, yeah, we should be up there. We're the third biggest. We want to do this. And that would have been right up the street. But knowing Tommy, Tommy will work every minute of the day for the mate Kelly, the team that he wants, knowing that they're going to be a team to be reckoned with when it comes to it. Nah, he's um, one of football's good guys, Tommy Wright. We talk about him regularly. And the very last thing we'll touch oh. on is, uh, you, you mentioned earlier on that you didn't, you wouldn't shout at kids because uh, the amount of shouting Paul Surick did at you didn't stop you moving to United with him. No, it, it was great with Loggy for me. Um, it just wasn't Loggy. It was also John Blackley. Mm -hmm. I give a lot of credit to John Blackley, the assistant manager that was with Loggy. It was a great partnership. When it was time to work, with the squad that we had, John Blackley would take all the defenders and the defensive midfielders to one side and Loggy would take all the, attack all the attackers and the attacking midfielders to one side and we would work on specific things for our game. And John, it was huge for me knowing for to get the coaching of a player like John Blackley and the experience that he had, not just for me, but for everybody to learn. And then when it came to it, as I said, Sandy Clark was the manager. I wasn't going to stay with a guy that didn't rate me, didn't want to play me. No. And I went and met Paul Sturrock and I said, yeah, I would come. And I think every Saints fan know or knew why I was leaving. As I said before earlier, I would have stayed at Saints if I'd handed it for Sandy Clark. But unfortunately, I moved 22, 23 minutes down the road with Dundee United under Paul Sturrock and John Blackley again. The same thing happened at United. Luggy left. No, he resigned. I'd only signed for a fort like two weeks in and he resigned. We could beat by Hibs 5-0 or something. The gas scored a hat trick at Easter Road. And he resigned straight after it. And I hadn't even kicked the ball for United. And I thought, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, I've just moved down the road and you've just resigned. <laughs> but then things changed at United, knowing that Alex Smith came in. Great guy. A lot of time for Alex Smith. Brought different players, changed different things. Got people out the door. And it, yet again, that was, that was hard at United, knowing that we were fighting relegation. Cool, yeah. A few uh, times. A few, indeed. And the very last question, we, we put out a lot of questions to our listeners to to see what they want to ask you, and you'll not be surprised, but the one thing that's came up is Derby County. Yes. Was it Jim Smith who was in charge at the time? Jim, the, the bald eagle, The yes. bald eagle, indeed. And uh, you would have gone down with what, I presume, what, Stuart Duff? Would it have been Duffer? Stuart Duff and Gus Stewart was one of the directors. Oh. And at my mum and dad there. Uh, you went down, obviously you wanted to stay. Said, well, what, what happened with that? It just, I went down just for to have a look. And when I got down there and having a look, I was just like, um... Jim Smith had never seen me play. He was going on a word of his chief scout at the time that had watched me play for Northern Ireland. And I sat, and I thought long and hard about it going, well, if the manager's never, ever seen me play and he's going on a word, yeah, don't get me wrong, he trusts the guy, but is it going to be the best for me knowing that this guy's never seen me? I could play one game and then be right out the door and that could be my career down the Swanee. Mm -hmm. And I just decided it wasn't right. I was in the best place possible knowing that I had Paul Sturrock and John Blackley as the two coaches that was going to make me a better player. Do I regret it? No, not whatsoever. I mightn't have done, I mightn't have done what I've done in my career if I'd have taken it. You're back where you started, you're loving life, and everything is all good in the yeah. world. It is indeed, and long may it continue. Brilliant. Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy no. schedule at the moment to come and speak to us, and um, well, hopefully we'll be back in the ground soon enough. Guys, you're very, very welcome. Anytime, just give us a bell, and if I can come on and chat to you, I'm happy to. That's superb. That's S-U-P-E-R-B. Not bad. <laughs> Thanks again, Five Dan. Points. Cheers, mate. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Nice Thanks, Dan. Danny. Cheers, Sam. Bye. Bye. You, I'm not even going to say this guy's nice, Dan, because people expect that. But we'll say it anyway. I'll say it instead, mate. <laughs> what a nice fella. What? He's. Oh, he is. Yeah, absolutely. What a top boy. Had all the time for us. Like, just, we've not spoken to a bad guest. Not one. No, we've genuinely not. And as I keep saying, I keep thinking he's going to come at some point. Yeah. But it might not. It's, it's basically a case of if they did, if they were going to be shitbags, they wouldn't come on in the first place. So 
they want to come on or they've agreed to come on, so they're going to be nice. Yeah, I think they generally know what they're coming, what they're letting themselves in for as well. Now they do. <laughs> now they do. I mean, Mac and Espy sort of came in, came in blind, but yeah, I don't think we knew what we were letting ourselves in for for Danny. He doesn't hold back, does he? The guy? No, he doesn't. And but that's great. It's refreshing. It is refreshing, and I'm sure that's what um, what our listeners want to hear. Really, want to hear people talking honestly, and yeah, he did that. Do you know what? Do you know what else we want to hear an honest opinion about? Go on, Sam. What do we? The things that are going to appear in our club shop of shame. Oh, I've got some opinions on anything that comes into our club shop of shame. And none of it complimentary. Well, we have got the merch. We've got it in the boot of the car. We have gone down to Errol. We've got our trestle table off the roof. We've set up our trestle table. We've put a nice bed sheets over the trestle table. We've laid out all our crap. And we're just waiting for the punters to come along and see what they can get for cheap. It's the car boot sale of shame. Yeah, we've done a car boot sale. I have done. We made a fortune. Yeah, it's all right, isn't it? Yeah. The only problem was when we did it, I accidentally sold all Lynn's maternity clothes by mistake. Uh, There was all like stretchy jeans and stuff and they all absolutely flew out the door and she went, where's all my maternity stuff? The one I was putting in the bag in case I had another child. Was this in between children as well? Yeah, this was after the first year. She had them in a bag and that was to go up in the loft. I thought it was to sell. Did a good deal on them though. How long? Between pregnant women and fat guys. (laughs) (laughs) Who loves an an elasticated pair of jeans. (laughs) These these will do just fine. But anyway, we digress as per. What have we got in the club shop of shame this week, Dan? Oh, Sam. We have got some absolute nonsense this week <laughs> More... in the club shop of shame. Go on. And we're, we're going to take a trip for the second week running to Merseyside. Lovely. Liverpool. Liverpool, but the blue half. Everton. And what they have, are flogging is an Everton branded. Now, I, I always have got several sort of means of being of qualification to the club shop of shame. And one of them, a big one, is sheer pointlessness. With this particular bit of paraphernalia, it's a very functional thing. So we're in Bolton Wanderers tape measure territory here. All good. Now, Sam, do you remember what it used to be like to go on holiday? (laughs) Just about. And to go abroad. It's been a while. Oh, God. I would listen to Jess Glenn hold my hand on a Jet 2 flight for six hours straight if it meant I was flying to a nice hot country. I think Jet 2 actually do do that. As you're getting on the plane, you play that. And when you land and when you're waiting to get off the plane. They, they hit the button. Anyway, sorry. We're on holiday. We digress. We're going on holiday. We're packing up. Or do we need um, swimming goggles, sunglasses? Check. Other things that aren't to wear, you know, around your eyes. <laughs> but an important bit of kit that we all need now is a travel adapter. Of course it is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, if surely. you're an Everton fan. Surely not. Oh, yes, mate. If you're an Everton fan, you can show your support for the Toffees by when you go away having an Everton-branded travel adapter. (laughs) Why would you need to have your club's, your football team's badge imprinted on the travel adapter? I don't. The mad thing is, it's not even entirely obvious where it is on the adapter. (laughs) My word. I mean... Last time I got a travel adapter, last time I went away, I think I picked it up from um, a pound shop. Strangely enough, for a pound. (laughs) It might have even been two of them for a pound. I don't know. I can't remember. If you're a massive blue nose and you want an an Everton-branded travel adapter, you ignore the fact you can get one for a pound or two for a pound, it might have been, and you can pay 15 quid. Get fucked. (laughs) No way. Get fucked. So far off. (laughs) That might even be... No, it's not. I was going to say it might even be more ludicrous than 200 quid for the the clock of nightmares. I'm looking at the travel adapter, and is it even branded, or is it just the box? I don't think it is branded, you know, mate. I think it's just a... It's clearly not visible. I just think it's just a normal adapter which comes in an Everton box. You know what? I think you might be right. That is outrageous. That is shameless. It's not even blue. It just no, it just, just looks like a normal one. Adapter. A normal USB cable which comes in a branded box for 15 quid. This is naked profiteering, <laughs> Bill Kenwright. <laughs> and I will not stand for it. <laughs> Certainly will not. Do you know what else is uh, naked profiteering? Nudist beach that charges. <laughs> See what you did there. No, they're, they're trying to shift old stock. I would say so. Like something that's sometimes clubs sell old football shirts from the season before for a knockdown fee, which is fine if you want something to train or cut about the house in or just want to support the club merchandise. But 
I was looking on many, many football clubs uh, shops this week to, to try and find something. And I stumbled across something which I found a little bit odd. It was on, originally on the MK Don's website and they were selling uh, 2020 calendars for a quid. Fucking no use to anybody. No, that's bizarre. Even for a quid. Unless, you know, it's to be cut up for child's collages. But a pound for a MK Don's calendar, which was ridiculous, but I was... No, I didn't stop there. My hunt continued. And the very next page I went on to was Charlton Athletic, who were selling a calendar for £4. And I went, oh, that's quite expensive. Certainly for a 2019 calendar, which they've still got in their club shop. <laughs> Unless this is a magic calendar that takes you back to the start of 2019. I would love that, to be fair. When, yeah. When times were good. When times were good. Unless it's that, what the fuck? Absolute nonsense. I, four quid as well, not even a pound, just get get them out the door. And that didn't include postage. So if I wanted a 2019 Charlton Athletic calendar, it was going to cost me upwards of about £8.95. Pence. You do wonder. Now, I'm not a marketing man, nor am I a retail man. I'm Alan Partridge. And this <laughs> podcast is brought to you by Dettol. <laughs> you do wonder if, if if anyone's actually bought one of these. Yeah. I'd, I was going to buy I you one. I genuinely question this. But that's that's opened up what could possibly be a new feature. We are giving away. Here we go, Dan. We're doing our first competition. That was meant to be a drum roll, sorry. We want you, our good listeners, to go out there and search the world wide web of every football club up and down the country. And whoever can come back with us with the oldest calendar still for sale, we will grace you with a prize. Most likely a Dogger Saints badge. But if you want to go out there and search to see who can find the oldest calendar, the record is held by me currently at 2019. We'll run this for a couple of weeks um, to give you all a good chance to, to scout, to see who can produce the goods. Take a screenshot on your phone of it and send it over to us on all the socials, Dogger Saints on Twitter, Instagram or Facebook. And whoever comes back with the oldest calendar, by the end of the month, we'll say we'll win a yeah. prize. You've got until a week on Friday. Friday the 30th of April. If you can find something, something that tops Sam's Charlton Athletic 2019 calendar, get it to us. Well, we'll come up with a snappy title during the week, but we were looking for which club is selling the oldest calendar and we want you to find it. Get there. Can I join in this? Yes, you can. You've got a badge, though. You're Jimmy, yeah, you're Jimmy three quid. <laughs> First port of call, Coventry City football. football. <laughs> Go for it. Have a wee search. Right. So, I can't believe we're actually recording me going through Coventry's website. Shots, souvenirs. Christ, they have a lot. Of, they have a lot on here. <laughs> what am I looking at? Why do you not have a search function? <laughs> have they got one? Yeah, don't beat you. They have got the 2020 calendar on sale for a quid. Nice. Oh, you never let us down. <laughs> you beautiful, beautiful people. You never, ever let us down. They've also got, and this is quite something they've got this year's calendar marked down from 999 that's all right that's reasonable i know we're four months in yeah you can live with that that's a decent deal but 2019 is still the is the date to to be and if you ever if you do on your many searches through the world of uh, football merchandise come across anything that might tickle our fancy send them over to us elliot mingus on instagram sent us a barrage of absolute shit this week so we'll we'll, we'll work our way through that until before the end of the season because there was a lot of crap there we have one wholesome stories or truly dreadful merchandise either or we'll be happy to accept either I'm awful thirsty, Dan. I'm a bit parched myself, Sam. Do you want to go to the Royal? Have they got an outdoor seating area as of the 26th of April? Nope, because we won't be drinking in there. We're only there to see Giorgio Boyle. <laughs> yes, we're back once again for our most popular feature, weirdly, is Giorgio Boyle and the Royal. And, and for the first time in 13 episodes, Dan, we've had a sighting of the man himself. This is exactly where we wanted this to go, Sam. This is exactly where this feature was designed to go. Are, are we going to retire it after this? No. That's fair enough. Because then I won't be able to say, get there. That's true. As, as, long, <laughs> as long as you keep <laughs> spotting them, we all keep speaking about them. No, yeah. we, need a, we need a snappy catchphrase for that. That didn't quite work. The man himself, Giorgio Boyle, has been seen and spotted by Kev Davidson, who sent the message in on Instagram. Yeah, Kev sent us a message. Um, really appreciate this. It's a bit of a um, it's a bit of a while back now, but anyway, I'll go from the top. So this was Kev spotting. So he was 17, 17 and had a job working in the Safeways 
in Perth, obviously where Morrison's is now. And he'd been called into doing his induction. And he said he was a bit nervy starting a new job. So, you know, when you're 17. Do you know job I had to do when I was 17? I had to sort women's bras out in um, Marlon. That's the dream. You'd think, anyway. <laughs> so he's got in the back room. <laughs> Sorry. And there was about 10 of them sat around the table, filling in the forms. He said, sat opposite him was none of it than our eponymous hero, George O'Boyle. Hooray! I remember this at the time because it made the front page of the Sunday Mail uh, when he was working night shift stacking shelves. Soon after Did he it? got sacked by, yeah, it made the paper. I remember it. So, yeah. So, obviously, the circumstances of George being there, as Sam's just outlined, were a little bit newsworthy. Yeah. Um, but, hey, you know, he had to go and earn his keep. Kev goes on to say he's not sure it helped his nerves being in the presence of greatness. So it must have been about the summer of 2001, yeah, which was when George's time at Saints came to an end. But that is a that is a belter. That's a belter, yeah. Um, at a work induction. That's a, a, a good spot of George O'Boyle. Of actual George O'Boyle as well. But there we go. Right. George O'Boyle in Morrison's. That, that feature wouldn't sound as good though. George O'Boyle in Morrison's or Safeway even. No, no. I think you've, you got to have it. It doesn't pop. Who's our second spot this week? Well, we've got our second spot. And this is coming from um, from Mark Jumman. Okay. And Mark at the time was living out in, in Edmonton in Canada. Mark's back over here and he's getting married at Loch Lomond. This is in May 2015. Him and his wife have then gone on their honeymoon to Cancun in Mexico. Lovely. Absolutely. That, I mean, that sounds ideal. A, a, a marriage in Loch Lomond and then a honeymoon in Cancun. Fantastic. Anyway, so uh, him and his wife were, were in the bar, I assume at the hotel here, and across from him in the bar, or across from them in the bar, I should say, was none other than a man who 12 months earlier was lifting the Scottish Cup, Steve Banks. <laughs> Pat, Paddy Craig. <laughs> Stevie May. Lovely. So Stevie May walked past him. Mark says, when he walked past me, I said, Stevie May. And by the look on his face, he thought, Who's this? Should I know them? Ah. Then Mark's only thing was to say, I am from Perth. And in that split moment, he reached out his hand and without breaking stride, just said, all right, and kept walking. <laughs> oh. oh, Mark. Never meet your You've heroes. Been... Never meet your heroes. They'll, on... They'll only let you down. Oh, that's a disappointing end to that tale. But oh. Mark concludes... It doesn't actually get any happier, really. No. But Mark concludes that said it was a bit sad as I was a lad from Perth, um, living away from Scotland for about five years at the time, and there was another Perth lad. He said, I had a few stories of my own that I could have told him, jumping up and down and screaming about his two goals in the semi-final whilst he was still in Canada, and then booking his flight back for the final within 10 minutes, or travelling back from Canada for a four-day trip for the cup final. He says, anyway, I don't hold the float by handshake in Cancun against him. He is a club legend after all. No, nah, no, nah, no having that. He's he's gone down in my estimation, Dan. Yeah. I mean he's 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 not a local lad, he's he's a Pfeiffer. Let's let's not be around yeah, the bush. Pfeiffer, but if, I mean he probably was just confused by someone recognizing him in Cancun. Yeah, which would be Cancun. Cancun. <laughs> but if you've spotted anybody, be it in good circumstances in the Safeway induction room or in I'll Cancun. Fall in that good circumstances, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> given the events that led to that. Yeah, that's neither were wholesome tales this week, where they neither filled you with joy this week. But well, what you can get from Morrison's is um, this tremendous meal deal, <laughs> right? Wait, I've just seen Noel. You're, sorry, I'm, they, that was a wholesome moment. I just saw Noel's hand, the Noel being Sam's eldest son. Yeah, I just seen his hand sort of creeping onto my screen. Do you know why he's called Noel Gallagher? No, Edmonds from Noel's house party because I love the 90s. Oh, we do love the 90s. Where's the other kid? The one, one who likes giving a thumbs up with a ball head. <laughs> the Lloyd from Dumb and Dumber here, dude. That's what happens when Lynn got a hold of it. Uh, we Miles, he's upstairs playing the computer. But if you've seen any players like this overexcited young pup, tell you all about it. Dan? i got to tell you, Sam, I'm very excited at the very prospect of what might come our way. So you people out there, you know what to do by now. Saints players, have you seen them? Where have you seen them? What have you been doing? Who have they been shagging? Who knows? <laughs> you let us know. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. You let me know if you've seen this. 
So have you ever seen Roddy Grant swimming the English Channel for the walls? <laughs> it could have happened. You let us know. Also, it could have happened. Lee Jenkinson down the middle aisles at Lidl looking for discount cookware. <laughs> Who hasn't done that? Oh. He might have done it. If you've seen it, let us know. Get there! <laughs> well, that, that's a vintage get there this week. So we've got a couple of games to review this week. Both of them are against Rangers. That's going to be fun. What would you rather get? The cup win or the league win? We beat them, we've won the cup. <laughs> that is a bold statement. But yeah. I think, it, yeah, certainly makes life a lot easier for us in, in that pursuit. Well, it's going to be a... We'll deal with Wednesday first. Um, one up top, Chris Kane. One up top, Chris Kane, yeah. Yeah, I'd... <laughs> I'd be resting players for um, I'd be resting players for the weekend, but I don't know. But the Europe, the, the league though, is a good chance to get fifth and get into Europe. Good chance to get fifth. There's so many permutations there. I don't know. You got I, right. Looking at it in the hole here, we probably need to look at it game by game, which is what I think the manager will do. So with no Middleton for either game, that's the one that that's the that's the one certainty in terms of team news. You know what? I think he can use the squad. I think there's going to be lads that are going to have to... The back three, you'd imagine Zander will come back in. Tanzer, keep him in. You know what? I would. I'd keep Tanzer in. I'd keep him in. I'd, 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 I'd have him playing at least one of the games. Yeah, well, it's, it's going to be... Well, the league game's a league game. It's Rangers. We know, you know what Rangers are about. The, the best side in the country. They're probably going to beat us. <laughs> There's, um, there's no two ways about it because they're beating everyone else, including us three times already. So The last one was unlucky. We didn't have a shot. Yeah. We barely have a shot. Do you know what the problem is? But do you know what the difference what? is this time around? Elliot what? Parrish, get him in. Oh, you got to do it. you got to get him in. you got to get him in. Xander, if you're listening, sorry. Give Elliot Parrish the captain's armband. Get him on there. Get him up front. Fuck it. Play him anyway. You can have him and Xander in the team. There you go. I do think we're due a result against him. I think so. I don't know. I think the league game's going to be an altogether more tentative affair. I think I'd be very surprised if we saw tactics that were dissimilar to the last game at Ibrox. Yeah. That 1-0. I genuinely think it's going to be park men in, and if we can get out on the break, do it. We're not big on scoring we... goals at home, are we? No, that's a worry, but... You know what, I could turn around. I tell you, I think could have played himself into contention for at least one of the games. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello. Yeah, I thought he was excellent yesterday. Thought he was our best player yesterday. That was just my the way I saw it. Um, yeah, I, I just think he's looked. I just think he's looked good whenever I've seen him of late. So if you can get him firing going into the last few weeks of the season, there's certainly something there. If there's an offer of a contract for him, I would take him. I wouldn't release him. I'd rather have him in the squad than not. Yeah, that's true enough. Yeah, I'm... The league games... I say, the league games are league game. We'll see what happens with that. It's not one I particularly... When we finished in the top six, that was a game where I thought... Well, let's put it this way. If we lose on Wednesday against Rangers, I'll still be more disappointed that we lost to Aberdeen. Mm -hmm. Because it's one of them where you think, well, we get something, it's a bonus. The cup game... Now, because it's so tantalizingly close, I would say we're three games away from we're three games away from um, the cup double. It is tantalizing. So I would be gutted if we went out of that. And again, it comes back to which one would you rather win? I'd rather continue to give ourselves a shot in the cup. And I still think we could. This is maybe the other nub of it. I still think we could lose to Rangers and finish above Livy. Yeah. I think so. I think Livy are fucked at the moment. But yeah. two games against Rangers. We'll have we'll try and make it a positive podcast next week. Any kind of result against Rangers this week would be excellent and a bonus, I would say. Aye, because you'd imagine they've not released when the game's going to be yet. I hope it's Sunday because I've got an ultra marathon on the Saturday. Oh yeah, forgot about that. Yeah, on a list of mad things you have these podcast hosts have done this week. I've actually had a pretty quiet week on that front. Sam, what have you done? I've signed up for a 12-hour uh, ultramarathon. We're on the hour. I get a text to see how many miles I have to run on that hour for 12 hours. So it starts at 8 a.m. I get a text, you know, either I have to run two, three, four, five, or six miles. And that continues every hour until 8 p.m. And it'll be at least 50 miles. It just... Now, uh, yeah, we're both runners. 
No, 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 I'm not a runner. I, I run, but I'm certainly not a runner. No, you are. Well, if anyone's my sort of five or six Ks a week probably doesn't qualify me as a runner. You with your ultra marathon, mm. you've got to accept it, mate. You're a runner. No. I mean, well, you'll be what's it? You'll be going to the pub and talking about um, the best gel sachets you can use. Shot blocks, cliff shot blocks. Oh, God, what's happening to me? Let's move on. But we've come to another end, thankfully. 13 episodes in, Dan. We have. Um, it's it's still so enjoyable. It's it's still an absolute pleasure, to be honest with you. And we've got, actually, we've already started taking notes about new features and things we can do for the, the next season. Because we're going to take a break. We've got four more episodes to go after this. And then we're going to take a few weeks off during the summer uh, to enjoy it, basically. And then we'll be back bigger and better next year. Yeah, that's basically the plan. We, as much as we love doing this, if there's no Saints games to talk about. You know, we've done a couple. We've done a couple of episodes when there's been no Saints game, but the summer's a bit different. But we want to. We want to take the opportunity. We want to have a look at what we can do, what new things we can bring in, what we can do in sort of the wider scheme. So yeah, it's it'll be a productive summer. Indeed. We're going to see how many 90s things we can shoehorn into the podcast. But if you've got any ideas for features you would like, do let us know. But Because we're here for you guys, so we want to put out the kind of stuff you want to hear. So let us know. A couple of announcements this week, Dan. This is our wee announcement section. Yes, we have got a couple of announcements. I'm going to start us off by giving a um, a big shout out to uh, friend of ours, Jordan Thompson, and a uh, lot Josh Henderson. Is, who... that, is that Jordan Thompson, a.k.a. number one cult hero groundsman at McDermott Park? That is Jordan Thompson, a.k.a. number one um, cult hero groundsman at McDermott Park. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so Jordan and uh, Josh, Josh, who works for Saints in the community, that's just fantastic work with them. They're doing the Kilt Walk next Friday, 23rd of April, um, with all proceeds going to Saints and community. And what are they doing? So they're going all, this is Jordan's words, they're going all out this year and they're calling it, the road to Hamden in tribute of the league cup win. So they're doing 60 miles between us, which that is a heck of a trek. So they're doing 30 miles each, obviously, which is the distance between McDermott and Hamden. So they're hoping to raise as much money as possible. The link can be found on all Saints in the community, social media pages. And if you follow Jordan on Twitter, that is at the real Joe 93. I'm going to have to greedy this. <laughs> capital T H E capital R. E-A-L, capital J, O, and 93. King hell, I don't know how he does that 27 times a game. Yeah, um, actually, I could see the hatred in your eyes there. You genuinely oh, looked. You did I'm not look. I'm going to have to go and get in the bath after this is finished now. Cold show. To wash the shame off me. <laughs> anyway, so the link, no, the links are there. All proceeds to say screen. And Joe, you know, Joe says, any penny will go a long way. And so that's a really admirable thing to do. Brilliant. It is great. Um, 30 miles each on that Friday is uh, a momentous task. It wouldn't oh, be. The heat gets up as well. Oh, Jesus, that'd be brutal. Other couple of announcements are Nick Dazovich. We we promised, we promised this for a week that we're going to start a petition. It's up and running. So as you're listening to this, we will post on the Tuesday morning, uh, which will be Tuesday the 20th of April. Tuesday morning, we'll post up the links to our Nick Dazovich petition page where you can go on there, sign it, and we'll get that off to the club. The more names the better. It takes less than a minute. They don't want any of your information. Just go in there, put in your name, uh, your bank account number, the three numbers on the back, and your mother's maiden name. That is all they require. No, no, it's not. No, you've, you've, what are you doing, man? We need national insurance numbers. <laughs> oh, well. my mistake. Yes, that's right. Yep, so that petition will be up. And the last thing is, we are out of mugs. We're out. We're fresh out. And if you've not got one, you shit out of luck. Yeah, indeed. Other than the people I've said they've wanted one, anybody that said they've wanted one, I've put one aside. So I've got a small pile there for people just waiting to get back to me about collection. But they are all out. I didn't tell you the story, Dan, did I? About I wouldn't name names for the person involved, but I dropped a mug off to somebody out with Perth. Oh, that's all I'll say. Because um, I was heading in that direction. So I dropped the mug in. So I gave it to the guy, went, thanks. And I gave him the big thumbs up. And then he just closed the door on me. That was it. I mean... I like, I'm going to have to go Mourinho again here. Unbearable disrespect. Unbelievable. But I got a text about two seconds later saying, that's my mug arrived, I've got it. So I presume you must have thought I was a delivery yeah. driver. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's been happening to me when I've been out on deliveries? And it's really funny. So I'll go to the door, you know, give him a chap on, hand the mug over. And obviously, as you will all know, 
I've got quite a sort of distinctive accent in terms of Perth. And so it won't even be that. I'm like, hand them up. All right, cheers, mate. Take care. Of it. And then I'm like, oh, it's yourself. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, where I did, where it went wrong is I didn't have my dog or Saint's hoodie on. That's what I should have done. I just got, all right, cheers. I'm standing there smiling and giving it the double thumbs up. Hey, look, it's, uh, it's your man. I've came all this way to drop your mug off. And just a uh, cheers, thanks, bye. Door slammed in my face. I'm like, for fuck's sake. But the, yeah, as soon as the text came through, it was like, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've got my mug now, thanks. I went, I fucking know that. I delivered it myself. And he was, oh, sorry, I didn't realize. <laughs> so yeah, he did um, He did apologize. So that's the mugs. We've got badges. So if you do want one, we can get them out to you. They're a lovely wee thing, a nice inclusion to your scarf. And that is it, Dan. Yeah, it's, again, a lot of fun. No, so massive thanks to uh, both Danny and to Jason. Who's Jason? So massive thanks to both Danny and Brogan. That's more like it, my friend. <laughs> now, I fully enjoyed chatting to both the guys who were um, fantastic. And once again, thanks for thanks for having me, Sam. And thanks to everyone who's been listening. We say it every week. We mean it every week. Um, even though, even if, even though I've just sort of basically slagged anyone off who hasn't got a mug and told them to shout out luck. <laughs> they are though. Oh, they are. Um, no, it's they say it's great fun. And thank you so much for all the kind comments again through the week. So until next week, it's goodbye from Dan. It's goodbye from Sam. And uh, goodbye from my son, Noel, that's joined me. Get there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>